Welcome back. This is the Knicks Wall Podcast presented by Whistle Sports. I'm your host, Mike Cortez. Joining me today, Sean Geddes. And back from vacation, Kyle Maggio. Guys, I have three simple words. Rowan, Barrett, Jr. I got three more words. Is a closer. I. It's hard where to start. Let's start with the Grizzly game. Going from the fourth quarter to overtime, R.J. Barrett, 15 points, five of six field goals, two for two from three, three for three from the line, three boards, including a game-time layup, bullying, bullying, second overall pick, John Morant, and rookie of the year, John Morant. I I think there's only one appropriate way to say this. R.J. Barrett's a star in the making. So, Kyle, I want to kick it off with you. How enjoyable was that Grizzlies game? And then I'll follow up with some more RJ stats. Yes, I was very, very excited about RJ Barrett. So excited that I watched that Grizzlies game twice. I said that right as uh, before we went on this pod. Um, I wanted, I I was half paying attention live and I just wanted to make sure I caught everything. You know, so I watched most of the games the, the morning after and, So, again, I'm watching it, just making sure I caught everything. And then, you know, RJ really sticks out to me, so I end up watching this game again. And it was like – it was the perfect embodiment about what we've said about him his entire career. It was the perfect embodiment of what we say about him in a lot of games is that he's a second-half player because he's an adjustment kind of player. And I thought we saw that uh, full display against the Grizzlies. He kind of had trouble finding his way in the first half. And then as the game went on, he just adjusted. He figured it out. Uh, He figured out how to use his body. I – I can't get over uh, people that told me about he had no wiggle because I didn't understand how you could look at that, which in fairness, I get the concern, but if you're going to look at that as a physical trait of his, that's a weakness without saying, well, the big payoff here is that he's just much stronger than everybody else. And if he figures out how to plow through people, it's going to be a big benefit. And that's what you're starting to see at age 20 years old is that he's just mowing through people. He's plowing through people. You know, the big bucket on Jada and the fourth there was just, you know, he goes out, sticks his – not really sticks his form, but it was a little, like, hesitation into a deceleration, and then he just kind of slows up, puts his forearm in, not really to, like, make contact, but just kind of, like, keep that space so he can get a shot off. Big boy Josh shit. too little. Yeah, Josh too little goes flying, and then it's not a foul. He didn't extend his arm. He's just too strong. And then what happens? Nice, patient, easy finish. And it's like – the reason his, his finishing is so much better this year, the reason that he has so much, you know, the frequency of his drives this year is because he's so strong now. And obviously being able to shoot, and we're going to talk about that a lot at this pod, but, you know, the shootings helped him a lot to, to create some of that space. But, like, just him kind of understanding, like, oh, yeah, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just bigger than you. I'm just stronger than you. I can get to the basket, and you got to figure out a way to stop the move that I want to do and not the other way around. Um, just seeing him start to really, like, trust himself and be that confident and, and it, you know, start to pick up more frequently like it did in that Grizzlies game when he knew he had to step up and be the closer. Julius was struggling with the shooting for a little bit. I mean, it's just, it's just really a delight. You know, I'm running out of words to say about him at this point. I actually want to apologize to the people. I think I I undersold RJ Barrett to you guys. I thought this was like a a 25, five, very good type player. And and we're already kind of there at age 20. So uh, might need to get the notes apology app out on that one myself, but yeah, I mean, just really impressive stuff, man. Just really impressive stuff. One of the first things RJ Barrett told us uh, when Stephen A asked him on first take, you know, why Knicks fans should be excited or why Knicks fans should want to draft him. He said that he was built for this. And ever since RJ said that, every other thing that RJ said has come to fruition, even in the response to like a lot of people talk about the Anthony Edwards thing. I don't really want to talk about Anthony Edwards anymore. Like I don't want to tag Anthony Edwards when RJ has a good game. That's getting corny, but I love the response to it. Like he just laughed it off. They asked him, he laughed, he said, I laughed it off. I don't care. And then he said, my game speaks for itself. 
And he came out there and really made that happen. And um, like, you know, th- just the, the look on his face toward the end of that Memphis game, like he said he was waiting on the opportunity to get a big shot again. And you can tell that he just really wanted it. Like, I think Kaz was like, you know, if if Kaz tweeted it, it was like, if give me the damn ball was a person. And that, that's exactly what it looked like. Like, he was just really locked in. He made it happen. He got to the overtime. He, like, to be able to get the, the pump fake and then get the three free throws and get to the free throw line and knock the three free throws down, like, I like we're, this is year two. He's 20 years old. And I feel like we almost take certain things for granted. Like, I know last year when RJ walked to the free throw line, I was praying for him to make two. And at points, I was even praying for him to split. So the fact that he's able to make that play in crunch time and get up there and knock down all three, that's amazing. The, the big three he hit, like he just, he, he's making so much progress every night. And I, it's, it's just such a gift that we get to watch this guy develop every night for years. Like it's, it's a gift. Yeah, he's, he's different. Like he's, he's built for this. Um, it's the title of his IG show. He's made different. Like he just really is. He's locked in. He's poised. Um, and not too many people show this at 20, you know, um, and he's really, honestly, he's getting right up there. I, th- I think that Grizzlies game was live for me because I already was feeling like that conversation with him and John needed to be had soon. Um, if not this year, the next. But the way that he showed up at the end and the way that Jaw kind of folded at the end, it was very, I feel like it spoke volumes. I think the most important moment for me was, I believe it was the very next game when he knocks down the three free throws to send a game into OT. And then he hits the three to end to ice it. I think that was probably the biggest growth is like you just said, anytime he went to the line at any point in the game last season, It was an adventure. I don't know if you guys read this. I I can't remember off the top of my head the outlet, but Drew Hanlon needs some needs his flowers. By the way, let's start there because he he fixed RJ's shot, and I don't think RJ's shot was shattered coming out of Duke, but he fixed it. And David Fraudsdale said, "Nah, go back. We want your your." I think it was his elbow that they wanted to move close to his body. So he fixed that this year. Completely different player. He's now shooting 73% from the line. I think he was shooting, what, f- low 50s last year? So it's. I feel like that moment was probably bigger than any layup on Ja or anything else that I've seen this season. Just being able to go to the line and just hit them calmly. It was – I can't – there's not many words that I can use to, to display my satisfaction with that. I thought the the getting fouled for the three was like – fun for multiple reasons one because he hit the shots which is big and uh, you know big enough in and of itself but um the fact that they're fouling him because now they're scared that he shoot threes that was the other thing like they were desperate to get out there because he's just been drilling threes you know last year i don't know that there is i mean you don't want to allow a a corner three in any clutch situation so maybe this point is moot but my just seeing it be rj barrett that they're you know sprinting to get out to and then end up fouling because you couldn't contain yourself like Pretty good, man. Uh, pretty good. That's the whole point. You know, he, he had another play. Um, I, th- I think in that same game, it was just earlier, where they did the same thing. They crashed out extremely hard on him in the corner, and then he just, like, really patient, you know, did a little pump fake, took a dribble in. Uh, I think Kyle Lowry stepped up. No, this is the Raptors game, sorry. It was the Raptors game, now I remember. So Kyle Lowry stepped up on him after he had pumped in the corner. And uh, – I think he drew in Siakam a little bit too because he took an extra step. And then when he takes the extra step, he then flung it back to Burks at the top of the key for a three. And I was like, it's just good basketball, man. That's good. That's good. Patient, smart basketball. You know, you got the guy out of position when he goes flying by you. Now you already know you're playing four on five. So what do you do? You draw two of those guys in now. And you, and then we have one of the most wide open threes we're going to have all, all year because of that. And it's like little developments like that are just so frequent now. It used to be like a couple times a week, you know, you see a couple fun things, make you believe a little bit more. And now it's like you're seeing like all these things every game. That Like I was saying that, you know, there, almost any way you slice it, almost any way you go now, any game you look at, there, there's always these multiple, multiple things that you just want to uh, gush about with them. So it's just, it's nice having like a, a really high IQ player on your team. We haven't had that in quite some time. We've had talented guys here and there, right? But we haven't had like really intelligent basketball players on this team the way that we have in, in a young 20-year-old player, which is, again, speaks to where he, he, he could go with this thing. So 
it's a comfort. It brings me great peace of mind when he has the ball in his hands, you know, even when he struggles sometimes, I don't, it doesn't matter to me because he, he ends up being better for it. So I just, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And that, yeah, the, the shot creation as well, like that kick out, I think Randall kicked it out or whatever. And he pump faked, and I believe it was Siakam that went flying. And like you said, for the Dylan Brooks thing too, the way they're closing out to that shot because of the rate that the clip he's hitting it at, is beautiful. Like, yeah, that's very loud. That speaks volumes as well. People definitely aren't closing out to RJ like that last year. And that makes the kick out way more efficient. Like, they they have to respect that shot. And when he stepped in, honestly, Alec Briggs and Julius were kind of standing next to each other, and it still didn't matter because he drew so many defenders. And he, like, that was a huge shot that Briggs knocked down. I was, like, part of... He just makes plays. And toward the end of games as well, like... And the way he found Noel, like, three or four times, not not last night, but the game before last. And he was just dropping dimes, like... And, like, I... I, Yeah, I I want us to have the ball in his hands more, honestly, because he makes such good decisions. I trust him with the ball. I know he does have his, like, you know, blunders and things sometimes, but... Let him grow through those because even in the like back to the Celtics game, he turned it over or whatever, and then he came back the very next play and knocked down a big three to tie the game again. So, you know, I, I the, the amount of faith I have in RJ Barrett is crazy. Like, and even to be like I was, you know, saying in the post game yesterday, I was just like, I'm so proud of him. I don't think I've ever been this proud of a basketball player. Like, I loved Melo so much, but like by the time Melo got here, Melo was a star already. So like. The, the amount of pride I have in seeing the way that RJ Barrett grows every night is like such a cool thing. And I'm, wow, like overjoyed. I'm over, over the moon, for real. I'd be remiss not to call out some people that wrote off RJ Barrett at a pretty disgustingly early point in the season. I'm just going to do this every week. I'm just going to read a, a couple. So this is from an article I wrote, actually, late December. I forgot what exactly happened, but RJ was struggling. And the whole piece of the article was R.J. Barrett looks like he's going to be good, so how do we build around him? And just the replies are just really laughable. Like, here's this one. I think R.J. Barrett is a bust. I love his competitiveness, but scores are born, not created. Shut up. (laughs) Who else we got? This is a good one. The Knicks already ruined it with R.J. After choking away Kevin Knox and R.J. Barrett in the draft, it looks like the Knicks finally got one right with Obi Toppin. The way that people use the internet as well to me. <laughs> Cam Reddish is better than RJ Barrett. Don't at me. This is a Knicks fan? I love this yes. sound effect. <laughs> Bro, it's just like, uh, this is a good one. Quick lottery big board. Zion tier, Zion Williamson. Tier two, Jared Culver. Brandon oh, Clark's okay. nice. I'm going to, I like Brandon Clark. Grant Williams. Goga Bitanze. RJ Barrett. Like, John's not even there. Wow, this guy's... I'm not yeah. going to say his name because, like, that's just, like, embarrassing, my guy. I, guy... Just, <laughs> I just didn't get... I, I'm, I've am i been making the same... First of all, there, there's a lot of Knicks fans. Oh, there's more coming. With, 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 a lot of, with a lot of platforms, we've got to apologize to me over Jared Culver. We got into some fights to the death over Jared Culver versus RJ, and it was less about <laughs> Culver versus... Uh, it was less about RJ as much as it was they, they, you know, Culver was such a sure thing compared to RJ. And I just don't, yeah. for the life of me, and I didn't even dislike Culver. I just could not believe that that was like some people really just want to see what they want to see with players. Like, I, I remember all the, the RJ is a selfish, inefficient chucker as an off guard for Duke is averaging oh five goodness. assists. Uh, just, just wild stuff to me that he I led, feel- he had the most points in ACC history. Of, for, he did something historic. I was like, guys, what are we like trying to like read between the lines on here? It was like it was nobody like wanted to admit he was good. 500 rebounds and like 250 assists or something. Wow, like he was like a he beast. Was the only person in ACC history to ever do it. And it was like, yo, you know all the people who have played in the ACC? Just Duke alone, bro. Even if you said it was Duke alone, you have Jason Tatum, Kyrie Irving, JJ Redick as a four year player, Jay Williams, Carlos Boozer. I could literally go on for quite a long time. Grant Hill. Christian Leitner, like that's like good. And he was playing in a phone booth. Like they yes. have no spacing at all. Like notice, we had notice how <laughs> notice how the phone book thing, the phone booth thing, only works for Zion. When, when they look back on Zion at Duke, poor, poor Zion, bro. RJ hijacking the offense. He had no spacing. Only Zion was affected by this. Not the guard who needs spacing <laughs> to thrive. 
has nothing to do with that. It's just blame RJ, blame you know, Coach K barely got any blame. It was just Which they, didn't even, they didn't even pick and roll those guys. It was just like RJ drive or Zion figure it out high post. Like that was the entire offense. <laughs> yeah, but Ken and, and it was, was he was like, a mannequin. <laughs> He was a defensive. He was manager. shooting like twenty two percent from three, and nobody said anything. It was all RJ's fault. Yeah, all, all was, our, like oh, I, I hate it. I hate. I, I hate watched, all the conversations. That's literally the that. only draft season that I literally watched because the Knicks were so bad that year. I watched every single Duke game. Yep, and Absolutely. I was just flabbergasted at some of these takes. I was thinking I was an idiot. I was just like, "What are these guys seeing that I'm not? That I'm just clearly missing." And they were focusing so much on like the things that could easily be polished, which Dranlin again, give him his flowers. He fixed. It was just the shooting oh, touch. Yeah. Yes. He's not, okay. He doesn't have a natural shooting touch. Fine. Look what he's doing now. He's using his body when he gets close to the rim. He's more comfortable pulling up from the mid range. He's more comfortable catching shooting from the three point range. He's doing all that. And he's fine guys. Like everyone was like, Oh he has, He's never going to be a good shooter. Okay, buddy. I don't know how you decide that it's a 19-year-old who played 56 <laughs> games is never going to be good at something. I could never understand that. They were like, oh, he's never going to have wiggle. He's never going to have the ball handling to get where he needs to get. He's never going to be able to shoot. And I was like, yo, for a guy you're saying can't do any of these things, he did some pretty amazing things at Duke. Honestly, I was sold on RJ from the first game. I, like, really loved RJ. When they had that tournament in Hawaii, I think they played Michigan State or Kentucky, and him and Zion were running wild. I just loved the way that he he got out in transition. He was finishing. He was like, you know, he was part of what made them a show. And then when, Z and I was sold again for sure when Zion went down. Zion went down after he, like, you know, something happened with his foot, I think. And RJ was out there playing with the shell of Cam Reddish and a bunch of guys that nobody can name. And he was balling. Like, I think there was one game, I think it was Syracuse. He had like 33, eight and eight or something yep. like that. And I was like, yo, this kid is different. He had that little fake pass for the three. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, he's so different. So people are fools. And yes, Drew Hanlon definitely deserves his flowers. People said very spicy things about him in the beginning of the year when RJ was struggling. They called him a fraud, a bunch of nonsense because people love to be reactionary and RJ is thriving. So everybody needs to apologize to Drew Hanlon who said that. And we need to champion him as well because he is largely responsible for this. And we appreciate him. And I saw a clip, or like not a clip, but like an excerpt or something saying that Drew Hanlon said this summer they're focusing on um, RJ shooting off the pull up, like RJ shooting threes off the dribble. So it's like oh. scary hours, man. Ooh, it's a wrap for the league when that starts happening. And that's not even mentioning the defense. He's turning into a very good defender. That actually caught me off guard. Not that he was bad at Duke. But, like, I think it was more of him just having to shoulder too much of the offensive load because, as you guys said, he played in a phone booth and literally no one else could score when Zion was out. So he had to do all of that. And people, I guess, including myself, mistook that for being an okay defender. But I feel very confident. I mean, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong. How confident do you feel when R.J. Barrett is guarding the opposing team's best player? Because I know in the Nets game, I would have preferred Kyrie Irving to be guarded by R.J. Barrett. Yeah, and and now to be clear, um, whenever we play this game, it, it's never that we think that our whoever I think is the the right idea. We've done this with Frank or other players over the years that they're going to totally shut somebody down, zero point scored. Like as you've seen, even with Julius Randle, you could play picture perfect defense. You can move your feet exactly to the right spot. You could anticipate things on these guys, and then sometimes they're just going to make shots over you and. It sucks and it doesn't look like you play good defense, but that happens. That being said, I yeah, I would have put RJ on Kyrie because if you even, you know, paid attention in the the Grizzlies game, there was more than a couple possessions where RJ ended up on Ja. Um, whether it was from a switch or whether it was because he started the possession that way, there was multiple, multiple positions. And when he had Ja off ball, uh, Ja didn't catch the ball much. And then when Ja did have the ball. He had nowhere to go with RJ sort of smothering him. So I realized this because I didn't notice RJ was on him a couple of times at first. And then I kept noticed that somebody else was on Ja again. And then they kept getting cooked and it was Burks. So Burks was getting cooked, but every time RJ was on him, that was not the case. And that's when I was like, I think all the, all this narrative stuff with RJ being slow or he can't move, or, you know what I mean? Like this, this has got to go away because if, if, if he's able to contain guys like Ja contain 
using lightly, you know, can just roughly slow these guys down. Then, yeah, man, I, th- I think at that point now, this is starting to be a personal play style preference for a lot of people where they think he looks clunky and the results really aren't there. If he's finishing at the rim, the jumper's going in, he's playing very good defense. Um, there was a, there, there's been multiple stretches. I, I, I love to look at all the matchup data for the entire season, but I know for multiple stretches, whether it was a week or two weeks, he was holding guys, you know, to basically 40% or under. And it's like, this is good stuff, man. This is not a guy who's just waiting by the rim and being tall. This is not a guy who's, you know, only guarding point guards. This is a guy who's being asked to guard kind of one through four, depending on the matchup. We've seen him on different kinds of guys. And it's like, he's got to figure it out. And lately he has been uh, defensively. He knows how to use his body really well. And that's not just when we talk about on offense and getting to the rim. He knows how to do it defensively. He knows how to stay in front of guys. His stance is really good. He stays really low. Some he doesn't really gamble a lot is another thing. It seems like the only time he really is going to be in a passing lane is when like he like crazy read the pass, you know, other than that, he's kind of like staying at home. I'm fine, you know, contesting, getting you to take a bad shot, basically forcing you into a bad shot. And that's just as important as being a good shot blocker or anything else, you know, getting a lot of steals uh, as we learned with Mitchell Robinson this year, uh, his blocks were down, right? But he wasn't playing bad defense. He's playing really good defense. I know it's, it seems like, an eternity ago because he's been injured for, you know, so long and so often now, but um, he was playing really good defense, but the blacks were down. So like sometimes those stats don't mean as much as, you know, we would like them to when guys can just do good things without it really making the box score. So I think that's kind of what RJ's problem right now is in terms of perception is that the box score doesn't light up the way that people would like, but if you're actually watching the games, you're seeing such an impactful player. And uh, I think any attention to him at this point is finally because of the box scores picking up. I think prior to the Raptors uh, or the last game, you know, he was shooting, he was averaging like 21 points, shooting like 60% from the field, like 50, 60% from three, like just, I, I don't know. I, th- there's too many things at this point, but the, the, the defense needs just as much uh, attention as the offense at this point, because he's been doing some great stuff guarding these guys one through four. Yeah, and I really need the defense to get attention because I truly believe that RJ is an elite wing defender. Um, maybe if not today, very, very, very soon. Like he, he he's going to be an elite wing defender for a very long time. I think at points yep. RJ is going to enter all first team or all second team, whatever all NBA defense conversations because he's just in the right places. He really knows how to use his body very well. He can test shots excellently. The only hole that he has is that sometimes he doesn't necessarily beat people to the spot. I think once he gets that down and does that consistently while using his body, he's going to be unfair. And I, I noticed that last game, I think it was against Schroeder. I think he stepped out to Schroeder and he like took a step in instead of a step toward the spot and then Schroeder got by him or he had to like foul him or what they called it a foul, whatever, but he had to stop him with his hand a little bit. And, but once he stops giving up that slight step like that, I don't think there's going to be anything that anybody can do with RJ. Like, I don't know. He, he defends people very well. He, he stayed, you know, he recovers well. Like he was, I, he switches well. I'm confident in, I'm confident in him one through four. There's never even a time he gets switched onto a four and I'm like, Oh man, like send the help. Like I, he just, I don't know, man. And it's a beautiful thing. And yet I have a guy that you can depend on who's growing like that and is so ahead of the curve on both sides of the ball. Like RJ is a two-way stud. Like he is a superstar in the making. And it's very exciting. Through the Sunday night game against the Raptors, RJ Barrett's averages 20.8 points per game, 61% from the field, 69.6% from three and 80% from the free throw line. Shout out to Stat News for posting that. And since March, since the start of March, he's averaged 20 and five on 49, 45, 75 split. What more do you really want? As Kyle says, we kind of almost undersold him, even though we've tried to be extremely positive throughout his whole career, Nick career. And now you got to start thinking, okay, is RJ not just the third best player on a good team? Maybe he's the second best player on a good team. Because I certainly think this trajectory can go as high as that. Maybe even the best player on a good team if we really want to get wild. But I'm going to temper it for now. 
I'm going to say he could be a very good player. I mean, their second best player on a very good team. Before we, we do our little cut for the ad, um, for me, I, I, I kind of had him pegged as second best player on a really good team with the floor that I had previously set for him being like 20, 21, five and five. I thought that was sort of what you're looking for in a, in a sidekick. You know, you're looking for somebody that's going to get you around 20 points a game. And then from there, it's what else they do. So if he was going to get you 20 rebound as a, you know, pretty well as a two guard, which we see that he does that every single night. He, I, I, I don't want to, I don't even know the ranking, but I'm assuming for uh, guards, he ranks pretty up there for his rebounds, you know, a game. Um, but the playmaking, we know that he can do, and he hasn't even been really doing it, doing it on full display yet, right? He still does it in limited reps, which rightfully because Randall does so much so well right now. But um, so there's that too. And then on top of that, he's playing defense. So it was like, all right, if we're already there for the most part, like this latest surge kind of shows you what his floor could be. And it's like, if his floor is a 25 5, like 25 5 guy, I think that was already that. So, I mean, it, when you ask what's more, so pretty much what we're waiting for is like the defense to get even better and then him to score even more consistently. And he's already averaging 17, 18 on the season. So that means we're talking about a guy who's a bona fide 20, 25 a night guy, right? So it's mostly about how and where he's going to take the scoring. If he's like a low end scoring guy, you know, and, and the defense keeps coming along, the playmaking, that kind of gets him in that like Jimmy Butler, Paul George territory, right? Where it's like, you know that they're capable of some stuff, but the same time like there, there's general there's like a just a, a clear crop of guys ahead of him i'm talking if that was rj's absolute ceiling but if he becomes a guy who's going to get you 24 25 a night 26 depending on if he's strong getting these free throws still hitting these threes it's like that's upper echelon shit so it's like to me that's kind of the distinction he's going to have to make this next year or two now it's like well you've really raised your floor up quite a bit buddy so i i don't really even know what what label to put him anymore is my kind of my point if you're going to score 20 you know well over 20 points a night i mean that that could be best player on a good team it's just a matter of if we see that now so i that's what i'm saying i don't want to even understate him at this point i feel like he does so much so well all around that it's like if really all we're talking about is the defense tightens up a little bit and he's just scoring a little bit more it's like yeah i mean maybe he could be the best player on on a good team i don't even think that's wild to say anymore but, uh, I definitely don't think it's too well to say. Oh, but yeah, we got it. Yeah, I, I, Sean, I want your thoughts on this right after we pick up uh, on the other side of an ad here. So professional segue. We'll see you guys on the other side. And we're back. So uh, Sean, uh, on the other side of the pod I left off with, I, I think, you know, we've been underselling RJ and, you know, potentially it could be the, the top option on a, a, a very good team instead of us kind of lowballing here as, as a number two guy. So just want to get your thoughts on that and, and kind of just the whole us pigeonhole and uh, these young guys in general with some of these labels we slap on. Yeah, I, I think it's a little, you know, I feel like people kind of rushed to make the first call or whatever, or because I even saw some of it. I forgot who it was, but I think it was somebody from the ringer um, yesterday after or no, after RJ's big Toronto game. Like everybody was t- this is one of the games where people started talking about RJ now. because It was like, whoa, like and everybody went to act like they were talking about him the whole time. But it's OK. And the dude was like, uh, yeah, he could definitely be this, like his ceiling is definitely, you know, second best player. And they were talking about, oh yeah, like he's a Chris Middleton type. And I'm just like, why are you still, you just saw this 20 year old making in- incredible plays in the fourth quarter. He's incredibly high lately with incredible efficiency and he's defending very well and rebounding very well for his position. And you're still rushing to put like a second best player ceiling on him. I'm not saying like, RJ is guaranteed to lead a team to a championship. But I mean, he came in as that kind of guy and, you know, nobody looks at John Moran and says he's the second best player. Like you just let him be the player he is. And I feel like I would like people to just let RJ be the player he is rather than trying to put a cap on the player he can possibly become because he's exceeded all expectations this season. And in the jump that we saw from year one to year two, he has literally improved across the board. So all the times when, like, when I'm happy about what 20-year-old RJ is doing, I always kind of, like, 
fast forward three or five years in my head and it's just like if he's doing this at this point like Kyle said if all that really has to happen is the scoring go up a little bit Drew Hamlin said they're going to work on the off the dribble threes this summer even if he doesn't come back with that in year three by year five he probably has it so I mean he's in like the ball handling is going to increase he's going to have increased playmaking opportunities you see that he already has the potential to do it I'm sure he won't get any worse at rebounding as his career goes on um, he's going to be a top tier defender so it's just like why do you look at all of these different things that this guy has and say, oh, yeah, like second best guy. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah, I think the floor at this point, like you said, Kyle, is second. he's the second best player on a really good team. Um, and the ceiling, I, I think that the sky is the limit for R.J. Barrett. And, you know, uh, Sean Erwin came up with the name the other day in post-game prosperity of Star J. And I like that. I think we need to go because R.J. Barrett is a star and he's a budding superstar. I believe, and I think that he needs to be respected as such. Yeah, I mean, uh, j- just looking at the jump from year one to year two, I, I think it, we've read these a uh, number of times throughout the year, but um, I just think it's important to keep pointing it out. You know, last year, 14 points, 14.3, five rebounds a game, two uh, two and a half assists a game, and, and this year we're at 17 and a half points. Uh, less turnovers in you know, almost four more minutes a game, um, you know, blocks and steals about the same, but more steals meant more assists, more rebounds. And just the percentages are of course so huge. Cause last year, that's all everybody talked about 14.7 from the field, 34.9. Uh, sorry. I read the wrong one there. Sorry. Uh, 44 last year and then 32 from deep, you know, free throw line was, 61% very unspectacular but you know this year we're getting just it, it's night and day if we if we told you these percentages last year I think everybody would have been over the moon if this was for year three or four let alone year two but he's shooting 45% from the field so that's just a five point uh you know field goal percentage jump right there the three pointers are the same it's, it's, it's almost 38% now he's shooting from uh deep and then you know, the free throw line percentage improvement is, is another, this one's double digits. And it's like, these are all so, so drastic from just one year to another. It's not, and it's not just one that that's why it's so encouraging. It's just, they all jumped up and they all jumped up the same way. And he's playing more minutes. Like that's not nothing. You know what I mean? That's not for all of them to be up at first. It was, Oh, the free throws are up, but the other stuff is still iffy. we'll see what happens. And then he only kept shooting better as the year has gone on. So it's like, yeah, I mean, 40, 45 and 38 is – and almost 75 is pretty damn good, man. Like, I, I will take that at age 20. Are you, are you kidding me? Uh, that means that's the new sort of expectation we have for him, the new floor that he's just a, at worst a league average three-point shooter uh, with upside for more. Uh, yeah, I will I, I will gladly take that. Like, I just I, – I don't, I don't know. It just makes me so happy to see 45, 38, 74, like – it's pretty damn good, man. It's it's pretty damn good for one year. I can't wait to see year three. Yeah, and then I think the icing on the cake is his growth as a leader too, because you're noticing it. At least I am on the floor now. Like he's getting in people's ear, like hyping them up, like Draymond does for the Warriors. And you kind of need that guy on the floor. Like having a good, like Theo Pinson is the perfect bench guy where he gets the bench hype you see how the bench like last night the whole bench helps i forgot who fell down but literally the whole bench went to go help him up and marky morris is like what's good with these guys and it's just like a different vibe again i really haven't felt this vibe since 2013 and i think it's appropriate that rj is now bringing back nick's tape because that's the last time we really had that and that was the last time it was a real team and there are some similarities where you have thibodeau a coach that knows what he's doing mike woodson also knew what he was doing and I think RJ is slowly becoming, I mean, Randall's the best player right now, no doubt, but I really could see RJ surpassing Julius maybe as early as next year. Am I capping a little bit or is, am I, I don't know. I feel like that's very possible. So I just wanted to spit one question off you guys. How large of a risk or how do you approach this summer now? Like, does this change any of your thinking on accelerating that timeline? Because Worldwide West is here. He has star connections. Leon Rose, born negotiator. Brock Ollers, I mean, another guy who deserves his flowers. I mean, just Noel and Burks alone. <laughs> My guy. But anyway, do you 
get more aggressive this summer? Like, do you go hard? Like, do you overpay Alonzo Ball? Do you start to package those picks for one player? Where's where's your head at right now with RJ's current playing? I don't think it needs to change much um, because I thought they were sort of locked into probably a big part of the plan with, with Randall. Um, so I, I don't assume that they're going to let him walk. You know, I think in some degree, they're going to try to show that they want to keep him. So I think he, no matter which way you cut it, if, if RJ emerges as an even better wing than you thought, then you're still basically pursuing another top wing slash guard option. So I don't think this really changes much for them. I think it more just kind of affirms what they were hoping the plan could be, if that makes sense. Um, I don't think it makes them shy away from spending the money. I think you've, you know, if if you know that RJ is now this and you know that Randall is now this, you probably feel pretty comfortable throwing some more money at a bigger name. You know, like if you, let's say, you know, Lonzo can't be available. Do you try to throw like a, a big one year deal type thing or like at a Kyle Lowry? Is that something that they could be interested in or feel like they could be interested in? I don't know that it's the right move, but I feel like when, you've accelerated the timeline with young talent like that. That's sort of the advantage it gives you is the appeal now to like, Hey, we did stink. We no longer stink. Look how good Randall and RJ are, you know, RJ still on his rookie deal. We could afford to pay you for another year or two pretty well. Like, would you want to come here type thing? Um, these are just options. I'm not saying I'm like, you know, locked into any of them, but it's like, I don't know. I don't think it changes anything because what, what else would it change? You're below the cap floor. You got to spend some money, you know, the positions you need it for. So, you know, aside from maybe the Mitchell Robinson situation with Noel playing well, I don't think really much is changed for them long term. I think they I think they know they got to get a guard is kind of my point. I think they know that somehow, some way, like whether you want to say it's the point guard situation or the shooting situation, like they need more offense and production from that position. So however and whoever that is, I think that they're going to still target them pretty uh, aggressively. Yeah, I agree. I think they know they need the guard for sure. Um, I think it does accelerate the timeline a little bit. Uh, these early returns from RJ and even in how I'm feeling personally, because I just look at this playoff race and I'm like, okay, realistically, like, and you know, we still have the chance to do so, but had we not dropped some of the games we shouldn't have dropped because of certain things, whatever, for here or there, like this could be a legitimate four or five seed already as it is. So it's like when you look at making that one extra improvement and you, you know, like your floor at that point is a top five seed, it changes things. And then you got, get the right matchup and suddenly you're in the second round. And if you, you know, so I do think it moves the timeline a little bit forward, but they already knew they needed a guard. However, with the two lot of, with the two uh, first round picks we have and the two, like we're not bringing in three or four rookies next year. I highly doubt that. So I think that they may be more, con- uh, more inclined to consolidate the picks um, which is good. That's how I prefer to do it. I'd rather get, like, let's say our pick is, I don't know, 17 or 18. The Dallas pick is 20 or one way or another. I'd rather have pick number nine than 17 and 20. Like, I'd rather go get, like, a Scotty Barnes than get two guys. who We already have rookies who aren't getting enough minutes here. So we don't really need to bring in a bunch more rookies. Like, there, there's so many. But there, we don't have the time for that anymore. So I do believe it accelerates the timeline a little bit. Um, makes them a little more willing to play with those first round picks, and yeah, it may it may also lead to a bit of an overpay. Like if you know somebody asked me in post game prosperity yesterday, they were like, "Oh, if Lonzo was for four years and a hundred million, or Gary Trent was four years seventy two million, what would you do?" And I was just like, "Damn, like I've never thought about Lonzo being four years a hundred million. Like I don't really know if that's his market, but if it is, like you pay it." I think if you need the guard, if that's the position you need, it's like, so I don't, I don't, I still don't know what his market is, but I just think that they're more inclined to go a little bit higher to make sure they get what this team needs because this team can be good right now and down the line. I guess the better question I wanted to ask was, does it change the type of players you want to put around RJ for the record, Gary Trent, I'm throwing him that bag immediately because that's literally what you need right next to RJ. But like before, like not even not even like a couple months ago, I would say, at least personally, I wanted to put like a star player that can shoot like lights out shooter. Now I'm more inclined, like before DeRozan, I was very like, eh, I'm good on that. Now I wouldn't mind DeRozan on a very short deal, like certain stuff like that. So <laughs> does, has that changed for you, Kyle? I mean, I, I've said this on, on many pods and 
I don't I don't think I, I would still really want DeRozan. I'm sorry. Um, I love DeMar DeRozan. He's been a, a very long time, one of my favorite players in the league that I just enjoy watching since his, really this last entire decade. Um, really loved him as a Raptor. Been watching a lot of Spurs because of him. But yeah, man, I, I don't want I don't love that. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I just think he with as much creating and how he does it, he has so much freedom to do that with the Spurs, rightfully so. But I just think the way that this team's going to be set up, you know, again, likely assuming they're keeping Randall. Um, I, I don't know that. I, I love that. It's like, it's fine for talent, but it's, you know, I, I still would prefer to invest in a guard, even if you got to overpay a little bit for a guard, I think you just got to run with that. Um, Damar, I think is fine. I, I just don't love, I just don't love it with with Randall and RJ. I just think that those two are already very unique players to have to work around. And the fact that they've figured it out together this year, I would hate to add another complicated type piece like DeMar into that. I, I've seen this debate like 6,000 times on Nick's Twitter, but um, I, I would personally just, as much as I love DeMar, I wouldn't do that. that that's probably where I draw the line. Um, I, I just still just think at that point, you need somebody who's a, a better shooter you know, and somebody that fits a little bit more with the spacing that you hope to create um, with the ways that they like to attack. I, I just think DeMar occupies a lot of that same spaces, especially Randall now too. So I, I, I'm okay on DeMar. I, I, everything Kyle just said, like DeMar DeRozan is a great guy. He's really cool. He, you know, finds ways to score despite certain limitations. I think that that's amazing, but I don't want him here. Um, I don't think that's a step we need to be taking. Uh, I want the ball in RJ's hands more, not less. And DeMar DeRozan is going to need the ball in his hands. or And he, even if he doesn't need the ball in his hands, because I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, shitting on DeMar DeRozan, but he's not much of a threat when the ball is in RJ's hands. I want people who are threats when the ball is in RJ's hands, especially we have RJ and Randall. I want people. I want someone next to them who's going to be a threat when the ball is in their hands, who's spacing the floor for them. Um, so yeah, DeMar DeRozan is not really what I'd go for. Honestly, I'm seeing a lot of, and you know, some of the propaganda started when RJ was whispering to him, but I wouldn't mind. I, oh, I can't stand watching Kyle Lowry play basketball. Really? I, I would tolerate it. I, I don't, I don't. Well, what is it about? I didn't really like it before, but I've grown to love it. I've, I've grown to respect the hell out of him since he won a ring. Like you just got to respect Kyle Lowry. He just makes it happen. He's that kind of guy. He's grinds it out. He's been super loyal to Toronto. He stuck around from the beginning of his career. I actually really, I used to really, really like Kyle Lowry when he was like in Memphis and Houston and things like that. But then like the, the flopping and all the like theatrics, it just gets on my nerves. Um, and maybe it's just cause he gets the calls. You know, he's just one of those guys that's very annoying to play against. And I think because he was on Toronto and, you know, he got to Toronto and that's kind of when they started kicking our ass. That might just be why I don't like Kyle Lowry, if I'm really being honest. Because we used to kind of kick Toronto's ass and then he got there and then they became like a good team pretty consistently. So if I'm really looking at the root of the problem, that's probably it. So I wouldn't mind having Kyle Lowry for a year or two. Like he spaces the floor, he's going to defend. Like it would be cool. It would be good leadership. So even if it was a balloon contract of like two years whatever one year 30 mil like anything it would be like i'd take that because i think this team is good enough to be very good next year and we have two first round picks and like oh lucas uh, lucas is in the media crying yeah what was lucas he crying, about? crying about the play -in. i was busy at work what was he crying about <laughs> The because Steph tournament? Curry is dropping 50 points on a nightly basis. He, he, <laughs> he doesn't want to see Steph in the play-in, so he's he, crying. I, the Mavs yeah. are giving me heavy buyer's remorse vibes just across the board. Yeah, I I, I still don't think we get those picks, uh, but it, it's funny to hear um, – it was funny to hear Luca complain about that. I thought because he was like, yeah, the quote was like something like, "Well, there, there's 72 games in a season, and then we got to play more games to decide who makes the playoffs." Like that's a little ridiculous, or something like something along those lines. I don't know if he said ridiculous, but the 72 games and why do we have to play more games? Basically, um, which I get, but also you know maybe just try to be better than yeah. the seven seed. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say, man. Like everybody's got the same rules, you know. Do, do you think John Morant and the Grizzlies enjoyed it last year when they were pretty much a lock to make the eight seed most of the season, and then they had to go into the bubble and then play a playing tournament, you know, and then deal with I think the Jaron Jackson Jr. injury, and you know I'm sure they weren't too thrilled about it either. That's kind of the whole point. It's it's not great for any of the seven and eight seeds, and it 
makes good theater for the nine, you know, through 10. And you just see what happens, man. You know, if you want to be better, then you should be better. I, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, like I'm telling you, as long as they, I, I've, I've quieted down on my, you know, Mavs lottery pick propaganda because Luca really was making it, so they just couldn't miss the playoffs. But they seem pretty solid there at seven, unless they start to fall down even more. But getting a six would be a bit of a task. The Lakers sliding makes me kind of nervous. I need AD and LeBron to get back. Mm -hmm. But if they're a seven seed and they have to face Steph Curry, I, I'm not betting against Steph Curry under any circumstances when the playoffs are on the line. So I think Lucas get, I, I really, I, it's just beautiful because it's so transparent. Like it's like right after Steph Curry breaks the Warriors record and you know, it's drops 50 and everybody's talking about him. Lucas like, Oh yeah, we shouldn't have to play this. Like, Oh yeah. You looked at that seven ten matchup and realized it was pretty likely, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I enjoy it. I, I do worry a little bit. I don't want to like laugh too much yet because this week we've now ourselves settled into play in territory. So I'm trying to be like, ah, like it, it, it's funny, but also, yes, we, we too are trying to avoid this situation because I thought I liked when we were a four and a five seed that felt a little bit better just last week. So let's try to get back there. But um, yeah, see, seeing Luca, there's a lot of crying, man. And I'm not even like a, and you know this, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a Luca apologist. I, I'm not really Luca anything. I just, he plays really good. I call it out. He cries a lot. I call it out. Uh, and he, boy, does he cry. He cries on the court. He cries off the court. And I just don't quite understand it. You're, I hate when guys were like that top five to 10 talent range uh, start like openly bitching, like, like nonstop bitching. Like I get that. Like the, the better players in the league are going to complain to the refs. I understand it's a built in thing. Our entire lives, as much as we, we, we want to complain about the refing and things like that, your, your earliest memories were superstars screaming at the refs about stuff. You know what I mean? It's, it's the way of the NBA. I understand it. But leave it on the court at least, man. I'm not trying to hear you complain now about the NBA rules. And like, it's just nonstop. Like, you just don't stop, just stop complaining about, about everything. One thing, like, I, I'm allowed, like, focus complaints. Uh, you shouldn't have something to say about every rule not going your way either. Like, it's, it, it's really just, just enough, man. Enough. It, I, I don't like doing this whole turning on guys thing. Uh, Normally, like, I like to have my mind made up about you and we just ride off into the sunset together. Like, I, I dislike Jokic. I'm just going to keep that up. Uh, ignore the MVP campaign. Uh, <laughs> just just pretend it doesn't exist anymore. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to do this thing where it's like, all right, well, I kind of like Luca. Now he's got to, you know, kind of go be a dickhead about things. So I, I would like if we didn't need to go that route. I did it with Trey Young. Don't be the one player. Don't be the one player crying about it. I'm sorry, Mike, but don't be the right, don't be the one player in the NBA crying about the play-in rule, bro. Like, come yeah. on. Yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. I think he just realized shit. Chris Tapps ain't about this, and I really don't have a number two. This kind of sucks. How dare you? Tim that, Hardaway Jr. is playing his heart out in Dallas, and nobody talks about it. Shout out to me. No, shout out to me. M He's multiple multiple years after all the slander he endured here. Multiple years of being a very good high-level starter over there. He's doing a good job, Timmy. Good job. He's a star in his role, and he always has been. He just was severely miscast in New York both times. But I don't know, man. Dallas is – and I was – I still believe it was a bad trade. I'm, I'm not, not going to get into this rabbit hole again. But, wow, this has done a complete 180. And it's – I can't say I don't enjoy it. Is I enjoy it very much. Oh, I definitely enjoy I, I I said this multiple times to Sean. I was like – I. Even but when I thought he was insane, I was like, I would love for you to be correct and me look like an idiot. I've been saying the same line. Then it started with, hey, I, I really do look kind of like an idiot. This could really happen. And, you know, now it's been warded off, but we've been kind of on that line for quite some time now. So the fact that they even have a chance in, the, in this stage in the game is something I didn't think that they would have gotten to. So I, I do give them credit. I Hopefully I end up being wrong and, and something something happens for us this year. But, man. I have a feeling it's going to be both of us end up being right in a whack ass way, because in the classic Knicks fashion, the Mavs pick will probably like the Mavs will probably get eliminated from the real playoffs, but still be decent enough to where that picks like 16th overall. Yeah, just annoy, just enough to be annoying, it's just, you know. Just yeah, just enough to be like to get laughed at, but not enough to say, "Hey, look, see, the Knicks were actually right on something." Yeah, it'll probably, even if they do not need the plan, it'll probably end up being like the 13th pick or some shit. But hey, man, I'll still run a victory lap. Because you package 13 with 20 and you can get eight. Hey, I'll take it. I really want, I really want to find a way 
to get Jalen Suggs in a Knicks uniform. I don't know how it possible it is or how it can be done, but I would probably pay a very large price for that. I would definitely one more, cry. One more good homegrown piece is like that's the dream. The, the miss, yeah, because I mean, like you know, the, the whole the whole reason RJ, you know, like Sean said before uh, with RJ is like. RJ feels different because like we drafted him versus like Melo was, we already knew he was a star and though we loved him, it was a different feeling, which of course it is. We want that organic, our team became good under guys who didn't start that way type of feeling. It'd be nice if we could just get one, one more here in the draft somehow, just sneak one more, even if it's another like little quickly type moment, a little Mitchell Robinson type moment, like you just get, give me one more, I feel like, and that's like the, the missing piece of the puzzle where you don't have to, like then you're really playing with house money on anything you throw around for contracts. You know what I mean? So I, please Mavs, please just, just choke K- KP. I'm sure your knees are sore. Your elbow sore. Once again, just take a couple weeks off my man. Just help, help us. Shout out Giannis. <laughs> All right. But uh, on that note, you guys get anything else? Nothing much, man. I got, I mean, after last episode, I have to say, Alfred Payton, great stuff against the Lakers. That was refreshing. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah so I, just, I just wanted to say that, yeah, because I don't, we don't hate you and we wish you well and, you know, good job. Yeah, that was like my favorite Alfred game of the season, man. So the one in Detroit, I mean, against Detroit before the All-Star break. Like he pushed the ball in transition. He got to the basket effectively and efficiently. You know, like I, I didn't say anything bad about him yesterday. I wrote great game elf on the board for post game prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I'm I I'm nothing if I'm not honest. I tell people all the time, like I'm rooting for everybody in orange and blue. Well, I have to say the Grizzly sorry Kyle, I just have to say I think the Grizzlies post game prosperities that had to be like an all timer, right? I think that went like an hour. And it was Oh just yeah, like it was late. And that was like and that was a Hall of Fame one. My dad was in there. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was like, wait, what the fuck? <laughs> literally everybody. And everybody was so happy. Like, there was literally not one negative comment. And it was just like, for a New York-centric thing to have no negative comments. Yeah. That's crazy. The, the vibes are excellent. Subscribe to the YouTube, guys. Yeah, you guys are missing out on a good time over there. Uh, it's, it's it's an overjoy whenever RJ wins a game. So please just subscribe, head over there. Uh, your endorphins will be fulfilled, I promise. But uh, <laughs> no, nah, I was just going to say, you know, uh, with the Alfred stuff, um, I feel like people misconstrue what, like, hating somebody is. Like, we don't hate anybody, bro. Like, if you're just not playing good basketball, we, it just is what it is. We're always going to say it. Uh, it, it I'm surprised that we have to explain this to Knicks fans so often. Uh, nobody hates anybody. It's simply, we all watch the same basketball. We all see the same stats. We all see the same weaknesses uh, across the board. And when you're not helping to fulfill those weaknesses from a position where you're expected to, then yeah, we're going to point them out. That's just how it goes. Uh, you know, if you don't like that, maybe you should be better at your job. Uh, Julius Randle, I thought he got too much slack last year and he evidently took it to heart anyway and decided he was just going to get better. So if you want to get better, then go get better. Go figure it out. When you play better, we're going to talk about it. You play good defense against, even though it was a depleted Lakers team, like, okay, then we got nothing to say. You you, you didn't shoot 15, 16, 17 shots, just chucking, 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 contested floater after floater. Then we got nothing bad to say, man. Like sometimes it's not hate. Sometimes it's just what's happening and it's not helping us win games. That's all. Uh, so I, again, uh, we are Knicks fans. We are from New York. This is supposed to be very obvious. Uh, this is supposed to be almost institutional knowledge for most of us at this point. So I, I would just want everyone to get back on track with uh, the proper terminology. Uh, nobody, nobody hates anybody. Nobody. It's not a personal attack, a personal vendetta when we want somebody to make more three pointers on the basketball court. That's all. One, one more elf thing. It's a more of a question for you guys. Don't you think he would still like my, I still want him and Rose to flip. Don't you think he would fit better with the bench mob anyway? Like, I feel like Obi, Quickly, Burks, like, that's exactly what you want around Elf, because Elf really can't shoot. Like, that's not even hating. He shoots 20% from three. I think him playing 10 to 15 minutes a night, I would obviously prefer Frank, but if you are going to play Elf, I think 10 to 15 with that second unit, I feel like that's just fine, because I really don't want to mess up this team chemistry, because like I said, this is a team chemistry I haven't seen since 2013. 
I, I mean, we, we know that I personally, like you said, I'd prefer Frank, but I would just prefer for Elf not to play. But I do think he would be much more better. And I, I don't want to say that right now because he's played well the past couple of games and he played really well last night. So I hate to sound like I'm trying. I'm not. But um, I think he'd definitely be more tolerable and it would definitely be a lineup that suits his strengths better to be in that second unit. And, you know, maybe finally run a pick and roll with OB. Uh, you know, have other shooters out there, have uh, Knox. I mean, not Knox, but uh, Burks and IQ. Um, but a lineup where he can be the main guy setting things up. Because even in the, the in his post-game interview from last night, that one of the questions they asked him was like, has it been an adjustment, you know, with uh, Julius and RJ having so much more to playmaking duties? And he like answered very quickly and said that, you know, it has. Like it's what he thinks is adjusted well. And I think that in a lineup like that, the ball being in his hands primarily could make more sense. Like, and it, he could set things up for himself and others. <clears throat> Just need shooters. Play, play them with shooters. Like that. That's been my biggest thing. It doesn't make sense to to have him start because all he he's supposed to be good at in dairy is driving and kicking. So, and then getting to the rim. So it's kind of tough to do that when you're not really the lead facilitator or two, and then you're supposed to be kind of attacking off of a different angle, stuff you're not used to. And it's like, yeah, man. Just if you really want him to control the game so bad, then give him like two or three shooters. Let him get out there and just spread the floor a little bit differently. Like it, it does him no favors either starting him. That's the other thing people forget when we say for him not to start. It's not just an Alfred thing. Like they're not helping Alfred either. Like even if they wanted to empower him more, you're not able to do that in that starting lineup because it restricts him so much. So it doesn't help Alfred be the player that he he probably the best player he could probably be, on top of not making that lineup as efficient as it could be. So it's a it's a two-way problem. So I do think just flip-flopping and and, and having Elf kind of take those bench minutes is probably a little bit better but you know th- to me the easy solution would just be start rows quick off the bench and then right like just not play elf which i thought we were hoping was the the lead up with the uh, rose trade but you know nothing ever really materialized from there so it's a, it's a difficult situation but it is what it is now that he's played a good game he's guaranteed to be here the rest of the year in the starting lineup 100 percent uh I, I thought there was no doubt about it after the trade deadline it, there was just no and any any last chance uh, Clippers dreams anybody had that they were dead he, he's here uh, you know embrace your starting point guard Alfred Payton uh, that's just how it's gonna have to go so yeah uh, I guess on that note though uh, the RJ Barrett podcast here continue to accept and embrace RJ Barrett as your loaded savior as a future top 2025 20, player in the NBA for certain a two way terror uh, you know somebody who's really just a force to be reckoned with and uh, the national media is starting to pick up attention with that so we'd be like yeah about time uh you know this is i'm not even doing the Knicks exceptionalism bit i promise but you would think that a a budding young star for a new york team would be uh more interesting but we we are we are not fully there yet so we just got to keep beating this drum uh you know shouting screaming at these people until they start to listen to us and uh you know just keep fighting the good fight but uh Let's go next. Let's go RJ Barrett. Keep reading the nickswall.com and all the RJ propaganda we can come out with, whether it's Sean and post game prosperity, whether it's articles that we're putting out, the podcast we're putting out, anything that's on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to that channel. Uh, Make sure you do that. And then we'll talk to you guys next time. Take it easy. Adios. Deuces.